Gentlemen, this is the most important play we have. The play we must make, though. Cut! 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 The Vince Lombardi Trophy is coming home where it started. Where do the town teams end and the Packers begin? It's always been 1919. That's the first time that they were called the Packers. It's the first time Curly Lambeau was captain of the team. Basically one of those people that everything that came out of his mouth was a lie. But he was so good at it, you wanted to believe him. The driving force behind the creation of the franchise, the survival of the franchise, the success of the franchise. Without Curley, there is no Green Bay Packers. And he had the help of, of course, George Calhoun, who was a uh, editor at the Green Bay Press Gazette. He came right out of central casting. He's the guy that you've seen in every movie from the 30s, the 40s. That was George Calhoun. He liked to drink, I think mostly beer. He liked to chew cigars. He was fond of uh, Limburger cheese. Just a good, crusty old newspaper, man. You gotta love him. The two people that are responsible for starting the Green Bay Packers, Curly Lambeau and George Calhoun, they had their first meeting August 11th, 1919 at the Green Bay Press Gazette. Nobody really knows the details of the first meeting. There were no notices in the Press Gazette in the days preceding the meeting, letting players know that they should show up. Curly Lambeau was there. George Calhoun of the Press Gazette was there. And beyond that, much speculation. The follow-up meeting was the 14th. And at that meeting, there were 25 or so players uh, that were identified in the next Press Gazette story. Lambeau was named captain. Calhoun was named manager. They were just starting an amateur team, an amateur town team. They didn't know what it was going to grow to, what it was going to become the storied NFL franchise. Forming a team at that point wasn't much different than uh, a group of guys getting a bunch of friends together and going out and playing in the park. There's nothing to aspire to. You just play ball, beat the stuffings out of each other, and then have a beer afterwards. They start out at Hagemeister Park, then they move on to Bellevue Park, then they move into City Stadium. When I was a young kid, my dad took me to games at Old City Stadium. And uh, when we passed through the turnstile, he only had money for one ticket. So the turnstile guy said, double up. It was a joy to try and find a way to get in. And they had outside guys patrolling with long sticks, and you would try to climb over the fence. And if they would catch you, they'd wrap you gently on the rear end or the hand to get down. We'd sneak through this hole in, this, in the fence, uh, and then we'd crawl, <clears throat> we'd crawl up uh, between the risers and the bleachers and sit in the stands. The only really time that would fill up would be the bear games. The bear games were usually the, the biggest games in terms of attendance. Emmett Platten, 6'4", 230 pounds, Outspoken fan, local radio personality, Packers shareholder. Outraged over a penalty and poor officiating in a Packer Bear game in 1936. He jumped onto the field because he claimed that this Bears tackle was continuously offside and the referees never called it. So finally Emmett had had it and he leaped over the rail, went out of the fence and punched this guy out. They had to take the guy out of the game. <laughs> On Platten's radio show, he was critical of Lambeau for signing Hudson. Lambeau decided that he wanted me to come to Green Bay after watching me catch balls because he had a good passer up there named Arnie Herbert. So he offered me a contract, and by then I was uh, getting contracts from everybody. There's the two teams, the Brooklyn Dodgers and the Packers, competing with them by pure luck that the Packers, um, they mail their contract to the league and it's postmarked first, and that's how they ended up with Don Hudson. If I had gone to Brooklyn, I, I might have never had a career in pro ball at all. They had no passer that was strictly a Ohio State offense. And in Green Bay, I got off to a good start. And things worked out well for me. But it's just a matter of luck. 
Under Curly Lambeau, the team from the smallest city in the league would end the 1930s with five NFL championships. They won three straight from 1929 to 31 and would win three more with Hudson in 36, 39, and another in 44. The league had gotten rid of all its other small town franchises. Teams were, become, were now reluctant to come to Green Bay uh, because they were because of the small gates. Well, the Packers were, were a good draw on the road. Teams knew that if they uh, had the Packers on their schedule, that they were going to have a good turnout that day for the game. It was all about the gate and what, what kind of money you were bringing in. They'd always get a sellout for the Bears, usually a big crowd for Detroit, but the other game was always a tough sell. Take everything you know about the game today and just downsize it. Smaller attendance, the city was smaller. That started taking me to the games in mid 40s. Anytime I had an opportunity to go, I sure went. It was watching a football game and it was also watching a parade of well-dressed ladies. And they'd make at least two laps around that field so everybody could see their newest outfit. It was a formal occasion. Women were all dressed up and just like, like they came right from church. Men all had suits on and it was just like a fancy affair. Green Bay was not an easy place to coach at the time. I don't think anybody had any idea what was in store for Green Bay, the Packers, and the National Football League. Nobody knew Lombardi really that well. John Torinas was on the executive committee, and uh, when his name came up, he said, who the hell is Lombardi? He was a great communicator, and if he thought you had the ability to be a player, he would get that out of you. He was a leader, and he could, con he could convince you that you could be good. Turning out or you running a dumb horse to drag out us. All you got to do is turn out. Everybody grabbing out there. Nobody tackling. Just grabbing everybody. Grab, grab, grab. One day we're having a scrimmage. August, hot, 98 degrees. He was a tough football coach. He de demanded excellence at, at every position. And if you didn't give him your absolute best, your ass was out of there. I miss a block, and about four plays later, I jump off sides. He comes running across the field, gets about 10 inches from my nose. He says, Mister, the concentration period of a college student's five minutes, high school is three minutes, kindergarten is 30 seconds, and you don't have that? So where's that put you? You got mad as the devil at him. He had a horrible, uh, you know, anger, uh, you know, a temper. Uh, he could be charming. He's had all these facets that were, were all combined into what the real man was, and it was everything. When I got to Green Bay and I met Vince Lombardi, I realized the only thing that mattered was could you block or could you tackle. They didn't care what color you were, anything else about you. I went up to the locker room, sat there looking at the floor, wondering what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Some people are born with a tremendous amount of leadership ability. You cannot do it by the book. You cannot coach an NFL football team by the book. And he walks down and pats me on the back of the neck and messes up my hair a little bit. And he said, son, one of these days you're going to be the best guard in football. It didn't take long for us to start winning. And it didn't take long for us to get into a national championship game. And then it didn't take long to win five championships in seven years. Vince Lombardi died at age 57 from colon cancer. Pro football lost one of its legends. And a week later, Pete Rozelle changed the name of the ultimate trophy in the game to the Vince Lombardi Trophy. There wasn't anybody like him, and there never will be. He will be more respected than anybody in the history of this league. He's respected as a man, as a coach, and as a leader. Anything that anybody ever said about Vince Lombardi was probably true. Uh, he was inspirational. I said, God bless you, and he said, thank you, and that was it, you know. Um, he was feeling very badly. I went over to his bedside and touched his arm, and he opened his eyes, and I said, Coach, I just wanted to tell you how much you meant to me, what you meant to my life, and how much I loved you. And it's been a wonderful ride, and you've made a great difference in my life. 
Someone who's attained that level of meaning in American life dies. You lose the person, but you don't lose anything else. I mean, the mythology, the meaning of Vince Lombardi is as deep today or deeper than it was when he died. And they didn't win for almost a quarter of a century. So I'd say his impact was rather substantial. As most people, my reference was the glory years, Vince Lombardi, those Green Bay Packers. Monday Night Football, Lambeau Field, the stands were electric. Highest scoring game in Monday Night Football history. Bob Schnelker's nickname was Sneaky. The assistant offensive line coach comes up to me, says, hang on to your hat tonight. And I said, what's the deal? He goes, Sneaky is unloading the playbook. The hell with the defense, they can take care of themselves. We are going for the throat. Everything we got, we're laying out on the Redskins. The, the nature of the game was like a ping pong match, back and forth. It was not a good night to be a defensive back. We were a big play offense. We used to throw like a hundred different kinds of screens. In addition to our deep passing game with James Lofton. I mean, we used to call it our Kmart offense, but we could we could light it up. We could ring the bell. We went out and it was it was pretty magical. We got into the maybe end of the third quarter, starting the fourth, and Bob kind of shoves me a little bit and he goes, just keep at it. You know, um, they can't stop us. He said, I said, yeah, we can't stop them either. We were doing some things that a lot of other teams weren't doing, throwing the ball down the field, being aggressive. True to form, we're ringing up 48 points. And defensively, true to form, we're allowing 47. This was a franchise that was mired in mediocrity. We needed to find a way to bring winning back here, to recapture what we had in the 60s with Vince Lombardi. I was hired by the Green Bay Packers around Thanksgiving of 1991. What brought me here was the opportunity. Ron brings me the name of a player to watch. This is in 1992, January, and he said, I want you to watch this guy. I knew right away that this was the right place. You know, I just felt like all that really mattered here was football, and that's really all I was here for. Far ran on the field, the field tilted in that direction. I pinned my whole career with the Green Bay Packers on Brett Favre, and he didn't let me down. When they won the NFC Championship game over the Panthers, it was here at Lambeau Field with all the Packers fans who had suffered so much through those years. The most exciting moment in my lifetime of working in professional football. To win a championship in Green Bay, Wisconsin, in Lambeau Field, it's a feeling I can never, ever describe. As I'm talking about it now, goosebumps are running through my body. To see Bob Harlan and Ron Wolf and Mike Holmgren and Brett Favre on the victory stand and Ron Wolf talk about, hey Green Bay, guess where we're going? It's, it's a once in a lifetime thing. And add the history, the great players, uh, the wonderful games that have taken place here before, and, and it's even, even more spectacular. Bob Harlan met me at the door, and he said, welcome home, Michael. And that, that kind of knocked, knocked me over, because you know, I was just here to interview. There's a hard-nosed edge to him, down to earth. To me, he's much like Mike Holmgren, and they're both been perfect fits for Green Bay. I'm a big believer in, in the virtue of humility and, and the fact that you cannot lead until you first serve. One of the things that I really respect about Mike, he looks at situations and says, all right, well, you know, what can I do to improve this and help us win? He wouldn't be a head coach if he didn't have a passion for the game. That's what first and foremost sticks out is, you know, his passion for being successful and being a great football coach. He's not afraid to take chances. If you're going to replace a uh, legendary Hall of Fame quarterback, it's really good to have an Aaron Rodgers to replace him. <laughs> In Green Bay, it's about winning. It's about winning championships. The expectation in the Green Bay are that you're going to win every game, regardless of who you're playing. Because that's what Green Bay is all about. It's, it's, it's our team. And when I say our, I mean it's the fans. This is Green Bay. This is Town. And this is something that's inherent in our blood. You play to win. 
That, that, that's why you play the game. You play to win. We had to take this moment for what it is. That's just a piece and a part of what we needed to get to the Super Bowl and win it. This absolute joy when you know you're going to be the Super Bowl champions. It takes that football team coming together on a weekly basis and giving it up to one another, trusting one another, not getting outside of yourself. I just all, all, all the components of the teamwork, the pride is in the bricks of Lambeau Field. When you hearken back into history and you, and you close your eyes, you can see the Lombardi sweep. You can see Fuzzy Thurston and Jerry Kramer out in front. You see Forrest Gregg all, all muddied. You see Bart Starr, Boyd Dallard, Ray Nitzke, all the great players. Greatest franchise in the National Football League, the most unique story in all of sports. It's small town America, it's blue collar America, it's owned by the fans. This is a franchise every other franchise in the National Football League would like to be. Packers, there's just not another team like them. And it truly is a miracle. This team is even still in existence. And yet it's not only survived, it's been the most successful team in the history of the league.